Welcome back to New World Next Week. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And I'm James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com. Being vaccinated does not prevent an individual from contracting or transmitting COVID-19. We've got that story. Plus, Musk and the Pentagon get even cozier. But first, U.S. says Russian nuclear drills interfering with our NATO nuclear exercises. Russia is holding their annual Grom exercises that will be held for several weeks, and the U.S. says they will include the launching of nuclear-capable ballistic missiles. The drills coincide with NATO's nuclear exercises known as Steadfast Noon that are being hosted by Belgium and held over the U.K. and the North Sea. Both exercises have been described as routine but come amid soaring tensions between the U.S. and Russia over the potential use of nuclear weapons. President Biden recently warned that the risk of nuclear war is higher now than at any time since the height of the Cold War. NATO's steadfast noon exercises do not involve live fire drills, but 14 alliance members are participating. The U.S., Britain, and France are NATO's only nuclear-armed powers, but five other alliance members host nuclear weapons for the U.S. under NATO's nuclear sharing program, Belgium, Germany, Italy, the Netherlands, and Turkey. Russia notified U.S. its annual nuclear exercise has begun, U.S. officials say. James, it keeps keeps cranking it up? Uh, it certainly does. And for people who don't understand the significance of this, I will point them back to a little bit of history, because it's often said that the Cuban Missile Crisis was the greatest point of tension throughout the Cold War, the point where we were on the nuclear brink. But actually, no, uh, pr there is a good case to be made that the actual nu nuclear brink was reached in 1983 because of a routine nuclear exercise, Able Archer 1983. For people who don't know, I will put some links in, but basically the long story short is they were having, NATO was having a, a nuclear exercise on the doorstep of Russia that had a few twists to it. This time, they uh, had a an operation called a, uh, Autumn Forge 83, which was a 170-plane airlift of 19,000 U.S. soldiers conducted under radio silence. They shifted the uh, Euro European Command Permanent War Headquarters to their alternate war headquarters. Uh, they increased consultations with cells in Washington and London, and they... They, they, they made a sensitive political issue a slip of the tongue in which they refer to B-52 sorties as nuclear strikes, all of which put the Soviet Union on high alert. They started making preparations for nuclear war based on this exercise that was going on. And that war was averted by Lieutenant General Leonard Perutz, who was serving as Assistant Chief of Staff for intelligence of the U.S. Air Forces in Europe at that time. He was the one who decided not to elevate the alert when the Soviets started kicking in. So um, that craziness, for people who don't know, uh, has come out in the past several years of declassified documents basically being released um, through the auspices of the National Security Archives. So I'll put in some links uh, to help you get caught up to speed on the 1983 war scare. Also, the public document a federal judge in the CIA don't want you to see, talking about a 1990 sort of after-action report, essentially, by Leonard Perutz about that crisis and why it was perhaps the greatest moment of nuclear scare in all of human history, at least up until this point. And now we have the NATO and Russia both conducting nuclear exercises at the same time while... I don't know if you noticed, but Russia is trying to ring the alarm bell and going to the UN Security Council saying, Ukraine's going to do a dirty, uh, a dirty bomb false flag. They're planning some sort of false flag attack. And now the US is coming back and saying, no, that's Russia preparing to do some sort of attack and blame it on Ukraine. We have false flag accusations going against false flag accusations. It's media monarchy drinking game time, Spider-Man double meme pointing at both ways. And this truly, I mean, this truly is a geopolitical game changer. The fact that not only has false flag terrorism and that, that idea sort of so completely seeped into the popular consciousness, but now it is being weaponized and used in a geopolitical stratagem of, look, this side's going to do a dirty, a dirty bomb false flag. No, they're planning to do that false flag. And uh, truly, I have never seen something that I think is more concerning um, regardless of what happens in this particular situation, going out from here, the weaponization of those types of accusations is off the charts crazy. So 
if all goes well, I will be releasing a newsletter this weekend that will be doing a deep dive into this issue, what's going on, who's accusing who of what, and what it really means. And if all does not go well, I'll meet you in the nuclear fallout shelter here in Western Japan, and I'll just tell it to you in person. I, it might still be visible. I've got a nuclear fallout shelter sign actually in my background. It's funny you were able to we were able to kind of steal those things in the 80s and 90s as it all sort of you know the Cold War is over. You, you can take all those signs down. How about a game of chess? No, let's play global thermonuclear war. Our second story on New World next week, episode 499, Elon Musk's SpaceX and the Pentagon deepen their ties despite the pesky dispute on Starlink funding in Ukraine. The Pentagon is set to expand its use of Elon Musk's SpaceX satellite capabilities despite a recent dispute between the two sides over the funding of satellite-based internet services for an embattled Ukraine, this of course all according to government documents. Space Exploration Technologies Corporation, the formal name for the company that Mr. Musk founded more than 20 years ago, is already, of course, a major Pentagon contractor handling sensitive national security launches on its rockets. Those ties are set to grow even closer and grow into satellite services, where SpaceX's Starlink division is a dominant player in key regions. Starlink's role in Ukraine's efforts to defend itself from Russia's invasion has underscored the strategic value of Mr. Musk's satellite assets. Starlink satellites have been a critical tool for the Ukraine military in its campaign against Russian forces, defense officials in the country have said, making Ukraine a high-stakes proving ground for the service and drawing attention from U.S. military officials. Just last week, the Pentagram said it received a letter from the company about Starlink funding for Ukraine Meanwhile, other people will want to get in on the action. European countries have also discussed providing funding for Ukraine's use of Starlink. Oh, I know who can pay for it, James. Maybe maybe the tax cattle here in the States. Yeah, bingo. Sure we can pay hey, up the debt. Yeah, exactly. That's Elon Musk's business strategy in a nutshell, isn't it? Uh-huh. Um, yeah, get on board with whatever whatever is trending, whatever the global elitists want for the uh, the tax slave uh, population, and then make it seem cool. And hey, guys, this cool billionaire is going to bring it to you. And here is the story in a nutshell. Yeah, in case anyone hasn't figured it out yet, yes, SpaceX is a military cutout. That's what it is, a military intelligence cutout. That's that's what it is. That's the purpose it is serving. That is why it exists. That is why uh, Elon Musk has the money that he does to play around with, to do things like buy Twitter. And I still see people, even in the independent media, getting excited about this. Yay! Maybe I can have my Twitter account. Thank you, Mr. Spaceman. Snap out of it. This is a psyop. He is not on your side. Every single part of the elitist agenda Elon Musk is on board with, from the brain chips to UBI to global carbon tax, you name it, Elon Musk is pushing it. And here we have the direct links between Elon Musk and the military. Yes, the military contractors. Everything that Elon Musk's, Musk turn, uh, uh, touches turns to... Uh, doo-doo, essentially. Um, he has the reverse Midas touch, and it almost as if it's on purpose. For example, he was, he was so generous that during these Iranian freedom protests that... I wonder where we've heard about those types of protests being pumped up by neocons before. But anyway, during this Iranian freedom... Yay! yay we, we, we want freedom. Uh, Elon Musk tweeted out, boldly activating Starlink. Yay, I, I will save you, Iran. Where, as it turns out, you know, you know, you actually need some uh, receiving devices in order to use this technology, which no one in Iran has, and which a few can be smuggled into the country, but it's essentially useless for anyone, so basically no one is using it. But now government, Iranian government scammers are doing phishing scams where, oh, hey guys, we'll get you Starlink access. And right away, anyone who comes up with, yeah, I'll, I'll take Starlink access. Well, we'll arrest you. So great way of flushing out any potential opposition to the actual Iranian government there. But I'm sure that wasn't part of Elon Musk's plan because he's the cool billionaire. Everyone can get on board with the cool space talking billionaire who's also getting all of his money from the U.S. government. And oh, by the way, was a World Economic Forum global young global leader. But I've been told that that isn't important in this case. 
Uh, it's only important when it's against someone that we don't like, I guess, right? So all I can say is snap out of it. Elon Musk is not your savior. Twitter is not a platform you want to be on at all anyway. And, oh boy, look at him. He's he's bringing a sink into Twitter headquarters as he starts to move in. Wow, what a cool, quirky guy. Let's get on board with this media-created psyop. That was the note I just made. Cool video of him going into Twitter headquarters. What is it, today or yesterday? Millions upon millions of views. He's carrying a sink. I didn't even look at it long enough to see what... Let that sink in. (laughs) (laughs) It's like... I mean, I guess there's a lot of them sort of like this. The World is Not Enough. James Bond film with Pierce Brosnan essentially has media moguls that, I don't know create news to the, then affect stock markets and military contractors. It seems like we're, we're just living in that sort of scenario now. But I maybe in media monarchy think that the, you know, the TV shows and movies tell a little bit of the truth, while of course the news does nothing but lie to you. Which is why we've been kicking it here for over 13 years in New World Next Week. Our third and final story, a little bit of good news. New York Supreme Court reinstates all city employees fired for being unvaccinated. Little icing on the top, ordering back pay as well. The New York State Supreme Court has reinstated all city and state employees who were fired for not being vaccinated, ordering back pay and saying their rights had been violated. The court found this past Monday, quote, being vaccinated does not prevent an individual from contracting or transmitting COVID-19, end quote. New York City Mayor Eric Adams claimed earlier this year that his administration would not rehire employees who had been fired over their vaccination status. New York City alone fired roughly 1,400 employees for being unvaccinated earlier this year after the city adopted a vaccine mandate under the former gangster mayor, Bill de Blasio. Many of those fired were the police officers and firefighters, again, depending on what time of the year it is and what news story it is, that they love and care about them or hell with them, you get your MAGA jabs. We'll include the PDF link, the New York State Supreme Court decision and order. Again, I mean, this is good news, but yeah, sorry about your luck if you're not a government employee, though. Other little bit of good news. Lawyers prepare to sue any state in America that tries to require COVID-19 vaccination to attend school. This, of course, coming up after the CDC's advisory panel voted 15 to zip last week for adding COVID-19 vaccines to the massively inflated schedule of child and adolescent immunization schedules. James, a little bit of good news? Yeah, it is something, and we're, you know, it is on the right track, and... Uh, As I continue to stress, I've stressed for the last couple of years, I will continue to stress, this is precedent-setting time. That's what this crisis was all about, the crisis-tunity of setting the precedent for future iterations of the scam. And you know, if they get away with this scam, they will do it over and over and over as many times as possible, which is why we have to fight back on every front, including, of course, the legal front. And do not hold your breath waiting for judges to gavel down on the right side of the law. But when they do, yay, that is good, and we'll take it when we can get it. Um, It's not enough. Of course it's not enough. Um, If if, uh, Alex Jones is $2.75 trillion liable for the, the emotional harm that he supposedly caused to the couple of dozen people who sued him, Well, given the fact that millions upon millions upon millions upon millions of people around the world have been subjected to all sorts of punishments and uh, coercements and illegal activities to try to get them to take a poisonous material into their bloodstreams against their will, uh, I would say that's, whoa, uh, you know, several orders of magnitude larger than what uh, Alex Jones stands accused of. So this should probably run into the quintillions of dollars, ultimately, of damages, right? I, I, I hereby declare that Pfizer and, and Fauci and all of these credents deserve to be uh, sued for uh, 10 hundred qu- quintillion dollars. Yay. Uh, it's probably not going to happen. But yes, we do need more of this action as well, as well as everything else that we can do to stop these precedents from being hammered in. And in, on that note, I will point to the good news that continues to trickle out from Canada to the extent that it does. The Emergencies Act inquiry that we covered last week is still ongoing. And I will note that the new premier of Alberta, Daniel Smith, is at the very least 
talking the talk when it comes to being a true Albertan and talking about uh, pushing back against the World Economic Forum Great Reset Agenda, saying we are not QR codes, apologizing for the fact that vaccine passports have ever happened. Not apologizing because she wasn't in charge of it, but saying it should not have happened and will not happen again. So we'll see if she walks the walk, but she can talk the talk anyway. And it's good to see an Albertan finally acting like an Albertan and not being a, a mushy, mealy, spineless jellyfish for this global elitist agenda. And if, I mean, <laughs> if you can't get a bunch of votes coming up in the next couple of weeks for saying, hey, I was always against the scamdemic, should probably, I guess, hang it up in, in politics. I know it takes takes two crooked birds to fly this fascist bird here in the States, the Cokes and the Pepsis. But man, it does look like, you know, you got to do armchair quarterback for it a little bit. I would not be surprised to see New Mexico and Oregon both go red this time. From the last, not only two years, but of course the previous couple of years before that. So that'll be interesting to see. James, I just thought another... Another bit of good news is is how much attention that real Anthony Fauci documentary has been getting. They've been doing online streams. We we aired it in the media monarchy community. That's getting a lot of people's attention. But when you were just saying you, you talked about precedents, you were saying, of course, it's important for them to get their precedents. I'm trying to look at it. Hopefully, maybe we can look at it the other way. We want to get our precedents and we can get our issues on the record. That's what we were talking about with the Trudeau trial last week. It might not be earth shattering, but it'll be another whole set of data points on the record so that 20 years after this, people should be able to rattle off all the lies like we can rattle off all the lies about 9-11, the air is safe to breathe, all the drills, all the insider trade. It should become part of the record, at least at least for humanity, if not for the courts, I suppose. I know something people were saying in my chat when we discussed this New York Supreme Court story was basically I would go back in, get my job back, get all my back pay, and then bounce. That is New World Next Week episode 499. I want to, of course, always remind folks, newworldnextweek.com has a lot of awesome stuff from not only Media Monarchy, but Corbett Report as well. You cannot find this awesome shirt there, though. Rage for the Machine, a listener gifted this to the kingdom. However, you can, of course, find Media Monarchy hats. James, there was uh, something recently. Uh, I think Richard Grove was wearing his. I think Benny Wills was wearing his. Buddy LD has been wearing his Media Monarchy cap. It's super awesome to see all those folks wearing them. In addition to just, you know, some Media Monarchy baseball caps, we are very happy to announce the pre-orders of the USB Data Archives 2010 for the Corporate Report. James, super excited about that one. We've been working a bunch behind the scenes on these USB Data Archives. So we will have the 2010 edition coming very soon. It'll be in our hot little hands. We will have the pre-order up on newworldnextweek.com. And of course, along next to all the other DVDs and shirts and data USB archives and Octopus Radio Plays. In other news, if you hadn't heard, I stream news, music, memes, and more Monday through Friday, 9 to 5 Mountain Time at MediaMonarchy.com slash Listen James. Next week will be our 500th episode. And so I think we're, we're going to do it old school style, right? So back, back when we started... Back when we started the show over 13 years ago in fall 2009, YouTube would only let you upload 10 minutes. I, James, I don't even know if it was 10 minutes. I think if you went to 10 minutes, it would kick you out. You needed to be like 9 minutes and 59 seconds. So back in the early days of New World Next Week, and it's funny to think YouTube was only three years old back then. You could only upload 10 minutes, so we had to kind of rapid fire our three main stories while I had a stopwatch to make sure that we didn't go over time. We will try and sort of recapture that original magic next week on our 500th episode. But James, there is 499 for you. Magic indeed. I remember getting to the 950 mark of a uh, video and suddenly having to say everything all in five seconds. Okay, bye. <laughs> oh, it'll be fun. And for all those people who are the true New World Next Weekers, who actually do listen to all the way through to this end part, this part. Um, you will know what's going on next week. We're not going to over explain it at the beginning of next week because that'll lead into our 10 minutes. So you can let those people who 
you know, are the occasional dip their toe in, don't listen to the whole thing people. You can let them know what's going on in the comment section. Anyway, I'm looking forward to that. It will be fun, and we'll see if I can contain myself to oh, just a minute or two. We'll yeah. see. We'll see. Anyway, I'm looking forward to that. James, thanks for these stories. Looking forward to talking to you again. Absolutely, buddy. Thank you so much. Take care.